Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try to summarize 15 years of work in 30 <laughs> minutes. Um, and uh, so I'll be going very quickly. And the key points uh, that I want you to pick up on as I go through this are listed here. I'm not going to read them off. Um, but uh, there, there are a couple of things that are really different from the ways that we think about space-time in terms of local quantum field theory in the bulk, and also quite different in, from the pictures that come out of ADS-CFT uh, for reasons that I'll try to explain in a minute. Um, so I'm going to begin with an anachronistic account of the covariant entropy or holographic principle. Um, I, I really think the first person who, who uh, stated this in some sort of way was, was a tuft. He said in the middle of a paper about lots of other things that he thought that the degrees of freedom should be living somehow on horizons, on areas, and uh, they, they had something to do with the shapes of the horizon. And uh, he, that was all kind of vague, but the basic idea was he wanted to explain the area law. For me, nowadays, I didn't realize this right away, but the, the really fundamental paper in this subject, where is Ted? He's not here. OK. Um, you don't hear the, you don't hear the music if you don't come to the concert. Uh, the, the, the really fundamental paper in this subject is a paper from 1995 by Ted Jacobson, which I, I really think is sort of the crucial clue to the whole subject of quantum gravity. And if you haven't read it, you should read it. I'm not going to summarize it for you. It's very beautifully written, very easy to understand. But you find things hidden in it as you go back to it that you hadn't realized. So basically what Ted said is that if we assume the area law for the holographic screen of any causal diamond, the reason this is anachronistic is because those words didn't exist until four years later in Raphael Busso's paper, which was a follow-up on the fischler suskind paper, which I always thought of as the beginning of the whole idea of holographic space-time. Um, but really, it's all intense paper. And what he said, basically, is that if you take the first law of thermodynamics and combine it with the observations of Unruh about acceleration radiation, and the Ray Chowdhury equation, which is just a general equation in geometry that tells you how areas change uh, depending on the curvature, you can derive almost the Einstein equations just from those principles. And what you get is not quite the Einstein equations. It's the Einstein <coughs> equations dotted into any null vector at any point in space time. And if you go through it and use covariant conservation, you can see that the one thing you're missing in the Einstein equations is a cosmological constant. The, these equations don't tell you what the cosmological constant is. Another really important thing about Ted's argument is that he uses in his discussion, he describes physics from the point of view of a particular time-like trajectory in space-time which is a particular infinite acceleration unroot trajectory, and therefore a system with infinite energy. And that tells you something that didn't follow from all of the uh, other arguments about the covariant entropy bound, namely which entropy, which density matrix are we talking about? We're talking about the infinite temperature density matrix. In other words, the entropy is the logarithm of the dimension of the Hilbert space associated with that causal diamond. You know, there had been arguments both to de Busso and to Fischler and myself that that was the case anyway, but actually if you go back to Ted's paper, it's in there. So um, the remarkable thing about this, which Ted says very explicitly in the paper, is that it means that Einstein's equations, except for the cosmological constant, can be thought of the hydrodynamics of some quantum system that obeys the area law. 
And that's really interesting because what we know about hydrodynamics from condensed matter physics is that hydrodynamics is true as a set of classical equations whether or not the system is in its ground state. In fact, it tends to be true more and more when you're in very high entropy states. But that in general, you do not quantize hydrodynamics. You only quantize hydrodynamics when you have a system with a ground state and you're looking at small, low energy perturbations around the ground state. And then quantizing hydrodynamics gives you phonons and the quanta of other small oscillations around the ground state. But in high entropy states, you do not quantize hydrodynamics. And string theory has taught us that all of quantum field theory, not just Einstein's equations, should be thought of as descending from gravitational equations in some higher dimension. And so what this says is that everything we know about quantum field theory viewed in the context of quantum gravity, using Jacobson's paper as a sort of guide to what the theory is, is everything that, that we know is discussing things that are applicable to small perturbations around a ground state. And let me point out to you that in string theory, both in the ADS-CFT correspondence and in traditional perturbative string theory in Minkowski space, we're always studying precisely small perturbations around the ground state of a system that has a ground state. So, so I yes. I agree with that. You're saying holography, all of the ADS-CFT is only just... ADS-CFT <coughs> is about, in the way that we use it, is about the correlation functions of finite numbers of operators in the ground state of a quantum field theory. That's only one part of it. I mean, what about you know, all this stuff about forming black holes and thermalization? And That's quenching? all classical. Yeah. And so it's hydrodynamics. It's not hydrodynamics. What? It's not hydrodynamics. Excuse me? It, no, it's, I mean, hydrodynamics is a sub subset of that process. There's much more to gravitational physics than hydrodynamics. Uh, not in this way of thinking about things, those equations follow from hydrodynamics of the area law, not just hydrodynamics of the quantum field theory at infinity, but hydrodynamics applied locally to space-time, which you don't know how to describe in the ADS-CFT correspondence. So part of what I'll be telling you is how to describe local physics and trying to explain to you why it's hard to do it from the point of view of the quantum field theory at infinity. Uh, I'm, I'm confused here when you say that quantum field theory should only be quantized. When, when, when I have some symmetry broken phase set with some, say, ghost from bones, yes. it's a rise that goes at some finite temperature. Yes. So there's a whole window of zero temperature, and then there's a critical point at which symmetry Yeah, is sure. So there so, but we do hydrodynamics up to that temperature, which is not close to ground state in any sense. Well, I, I would say it's close to ground state in, in the sense that it's not probing the, the entire Hilbert space of the it has, system. It, it, it has volume law entropy. Sorry? It doesn't have area law entropy. It has at any finite temperature. That's, of course. Okay. But it, it, this is, I'm, I'm saying more than that. I'm saying that, that that approach, okay, is valid up to a finite temperature. So basically it's saying that there's a cutoff on the Hilbert space. You're not discussing the full Hilbert space that's available to the system in that region when you're doing hydrodynamics. And if, you're, if you have a, a constraint on the energy, then you can still do those quantized hydrodynamic equations in that regime. But you're, when we study black holes, or we try to study the entropy of de Sitter space, we're trying to study the maximal entropy state that's allowed by the system. And according to Jacobson's derivation, that's the state you would see at infinite temperature. <coughs> hydrodynamics is, quantized hydrodynamics is not applicable there, although classical hydrodynamics is. Okay. Now, the... Theory of holographic space-time started off with papers that uh, Willie Fischler and I wrote separately, trying to understand what the cosmological constant was. And the way to say that properly 
is that you can think of the cosmological constant in this context not as something that contributes to local hydrodynamics. It's precisely what Jacobson's derivation shows you is not true. But as something that is a boundary condition on hydrodynamics in the limit of very large causal diamonds. Now, there are two senses in which a causal diamond in a Lorentzian spacetime can be large. The proper time between the past and future tips can get very large, or the area of the holographic screen can get large. And in the uh, asymptotically de Sitter or, asympto or anti de Sitter or asymptotically flat cases, we have a different behavior of area, which is entropy, versus proper time that is roughly classified by whether the cosmological constant is zero, positive, or negative. If the cosmological constant is positive, proper time goes to infinity, the entropy remains finite. If the cosmological constant is negative, and we're insisting on anti-de-sitter boundary conditions, or things that are close to anti-de-sitter boundary conditions, then in fact what happens is that at a finite proper time, the area becomes infinite. That's shown in this picture over here, which, excuse me to you people over on the right, I forgot to reproduce on the right-hand side. The Penrose diagram of a finite causal diamond in anti-de Sitter space with a proper time that's, roughly speaking, larger than the anti-de Sitter radius looks like this. It goes all the way out to the boundary, and it has an, a section of infinite area on the boundary with a time-like uh, part of the boundary there. The time evolution operator of the field theory of ADS-CFT is talking about e evolution along that infinite part of the boundary. And so it has mixed up the local physics that happens in small causal diamonds with an infinite set of extra degrees of freedom. Now, what I will try to argue to you is that many, indeed most, of those degrees of freedom cannot be understood in bulk quantum field theory. And so when I was objecting to the way we use the ADSC CFT correspondence is we sort of use the fact that we can calculate these correlation functions of a few local operators and think of those as quantum field theory in the bulk calcula calculations in certain kinematic regimes. And we use that and sort of assume that that means that the quantum field theory in the bulk captures all of the degrees of freedom. And what I'm going to, except those that are, quote, at very high energy. Now, what I'm going to, uh, what I'm going to, to emphasize to you is that high energy with respect to whom is a really important question. Okay? So, yeah. So, sorry, I missed something. In the context of ADS, like the picture you brought, you're thinking of the extra degrees of freedom as the CF. Degree no. 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 What are they? You'll see, just let's 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 step back. Okay. Let's see what they are in the simpler case of a finite causal diamond, and then and then we can discuss. Yeah. I understand it much less yeah. for the ADS case than I do for finite causal yeah, diamonds. In ADS CFT, the, the party line at least. Is I know what the party the line is, Steve. I'm okay. specifically so telling you, I'm I don't believe the, the party line. Okay. Good. Okay. All right. One of the implications of this is that the theory of a stable de Sitter space, a space which by assumption as time goes to infinity remains de Sitter space. Some people reject the possibility of such a thing. But if it exists, this principle tells you it has a finite dimensional Hilbert space. And I'll show you a model of such a system uh, a little bit later. Didn't you tell us on the previous transparency that everything has a finite dimensional Hilbert No, every finite area causal diamond has a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Very specifically, in ADS, finite proper time causal diamonds do not if the time is too long. And in Minkowski space, if the time goes to infinity, then the area goes to infinity. And I'm going to talk about that a lot. 
So the other place where you can see these things coming up is in the black hole metric for a Schwarzschild de Sitter or anti-de Sitter black hole. You're all very familiar with that for the anti-de Sitter case. For the de Sitter case, it's also very well known. Gary knew it long before I did. It tells you some of these same things. In particular, what you find is that you can't make a black hole of arbitrary large size. So the energy of localized excitations into sitter space is bounded. The Hamiltonian is bounded, suggesting a finite dimensional Hilbert space. The Gibbons Hawking entropy is finite. And the most interesting thing about this whole formula is you can ask what happens when I put a local excitation, what happens to the entropy of de Sitter space? It goes down. A local excitation is somehow a constraint on the Hilbert space that reduces the entropy. And if I make the mass small compared to the maximal mass, then it reduces the entropy precisely what, by what Boltzmann laws Boltzmann's law says you would expect from a temperature equal to the de Sitter temperature. And you can derive the de Sitter temperature from this formula without quantum field theory. And again, this is well known to many people in general relativity. This is the most important principle that I'm going to tell you about. Local excitations are constrained states of the fundamental degrees of freedom. So now I'm going to talk about how to think about what the actual fundamental degrees of freedom are, the, what I think the operator algebra of quantum gravity is. And the way I'm going to do it is to think about asymptotically flat space, think about what happens there, then back off to a finite causal diamond, and then for the de Sitter case, just sort of stop at that finite causal diamond and say that's, that's what's going on. So um, another set of papers I recommend that you all read, there are a lot of them, of these papers that Andy Strominger has been writing about the BMS generators. <coughs> and in particular, the first one, where he talks about christodoulou kleinerman boundary conditions. Um, the BMS generators are basically telling you about momentum flow out to the boundary of Minkowski space. You all know the causal diamond of the boundary of Minkowski space looks like this. This is scry minus, scry plus, et cetera. There's a way, basically, that the BMS algebra maps that into momentum space. The BMS algebra is an infinite set of commuting generators, which I, if I think of them as fields localized on the sphere, they are delta function measures. Okay? They say momentum goes out precisely at this angle. That's what a BMS generator is telling you about. And so there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the uh, angle part of null infinity and the momentum that's going out through that angle. So you can just think of the angle as encoded in the momentum, and then the amount of momentum that goes out is encoded, of course, also in the momentum. And so this picture in momentum space turns into the momentum space light cone, p squared equals 0. These are no momenta going out or coming in at infinity. Going out or coming in is the sign of p naught. That's a convention. I like to think of positive p naught as outgoing. And then incoming things have negative p naught. You can choose another convention if you like. The other nice thing about this way of mapping is that it allows you to think about massive particles in a much more sensible way than you can in the usual Penrose diagram picture. In the usual Penrose diagram picture, massive particles go to this singular point up here. Now, that's really an artifact of going out to infinity. If I take any finite causal diamond and I have a time-like trajectory, 
that time-like trajectory will penetrate the boundary of that finite causal diamond someplace. And the only difference between a massive particle and a massless particle is that when the massless particle goes through, it's all pointed out. And if a massive particle comes through, part of its momentum is pointed up the causal diamond. And so you can describe a massive particle by just telling me what the balance is between the part of the generator, say, carrying positive energy, so this is outgoing momentum, but the part of the generator that points out of the sphere and the part that points into the sphere at that time. This in, in Minkowski space, this is just the simple statement that you can write any massive momentum as a sum of two time-like, I'm sorry, any time-like momentum as a sum of two null momenta. And we know that from E plus E minus annihilation if we're particle physicists. So that describes the BMS algebra. The, uh, one of the important things we learned from that is that these generators should be thought of as operator valued measures on the cone. But then if I'm thinking about a theory that's fundamental, a theory of quantum gravity, everything I said so far, we could apply to Yang-Mills theory. Okay? But if I'm thinking about a theory that's fundamental, the algebra of operators that I described should capture all the quantum numbers that could possibly go out. And in particular, if I think about some null direction, I can ask, can spin go out? And there should be operators that carry spin and if I'm thinking about one direction, some of those had better carry spin a half if I ever want to describe fermions. I actually think there's a, a tighter argument than that for why the generators have to be spinners. And um, you then write down the algebra that you can write down for such spinner generators. They're, they depend on two things. They depend on the null momentum capital P and another discrete finite quantum number that I'll call little p, just counts how many of these generators there are, and they form some super algebra that looks like this. Now there are only, given the ZPQs um, and their commutation relations with the Qs, that forms some closed super algebra. In a minute, we'll see that the holographic principle says that that closed superalgebra should be one that has a finite dimensional unitary representation that's swept out by the action of the fermionic generators. And there are lots of such algebras. Um, the only ambiguity is what I, as to what I put here as a function of P and Q, if two things are going out at different directions at infinity, they better anti-commute with each other if they're spinners. And so there's a delta of P dot Q in the anti-commutator. And then there's a momentum that sits in front there. And if P dot Q is 0, then P and Q both point in the same direction. And one of them has a smaller magnitude. Okay, So it has smaller longitudinal momentum. And that one is the one that we pick here. M mu of P and Q means the minimum of the two. Yeah? Um, so if you had a supersymmetric field theory in flat space, um, can you construct these generators, the superpartners of the you, you can construct these generators in supersymmetric field theory in, in flat space. Oh? Yep. So two questions. Um, one is, are these in the end supposed to be all of the generators of the algebra? This is supposed to be the algebra that sweeps out the Hilbert space. Okay. Uh, and then if we think about uh, the full Minkowski case, I know, well, you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space if you have a finite diamond, but for the full Minkowski case, you have an infinite dimensional Hilbert right, space. Right, but they're an infinite set of Ps. Yeah, and I guess, but you don't really have to deal with the type 3 case, type 3 von Neumann algebras, is that right? Is what? Uh, um, I, quite frankly, I don't, I don't know exactly what classification this algebra falls into in the, in the Murray von Neumann classification. Um, I think I, I wrote a paper in which I said I thought it was type 2 infinity. Okay. Okay. 
And that may, that may be right. But the most important thing I'm going to tell you about is that we should really always think of these infinite questions as limits of finite things. And then if I go to finite things, then it's absolutely clear what to write down here. Okay? There, was no, there were no questions anymore. And all of that funny mathematics and the funny business about tensor products and so on just doesn't matter. Now, this algebra is compatible with, and we impose this condition. And those of you who know about light cone quantization, light front <coughs> quantization more properly, will recognize this condition as the condition that says that at the tangent plane to the null momentum p, that q is a spinner in the transverse directions. That's what it says. The, the full spinner de decomposes into one that's uh, two transverse spinners, one that's left moving along p and one that's right moving along p, and this projects out one of them. And so the general thing is that I should think of these q's as spinners that live on the holographic screen, okay, because the transverse plane is the holographic screen. It's the tangent space to the holographic screen. So these are spinners that live on the holographic screen. And that's what we're going to generalize to the finite causal diamond case. This algebra, if there's a pair, a, 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 an index P for which this Z00 equals 1, this algebra contains the SUSY algebra. And for that particular Z, if I leave off this singular piece, you see that it just is the algebra of a superparticle. So the, uh, at fixed P, these things sort of tell you about superparticles going out at that momentum. Now, these things should be called half measures. Um, that was, that's supposed to be a joke. Um, <laughs> mathematicians call them half densities. They just don't know how to make jokes. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the basic idea, and the most important idea for the rest of what I'm going to say is there's, if, if I could really think of everything that's going on as the scattering of particles, then we would just say, ah, the degrees of freedom in infinity consist entirely of particles. But it's well known that that's not true in theories that have massless particles. And in low enough dimension, like four, and I'll mostly be talking about four dimensions from now on, in low enough dimension, that the neglect of the fact that there are states that don't behave like particles, that is to say, don't have the momentum that's going out concentrated in some way at infinity, the neglect of those leads to infrared divergences. Those divergences occur because it is, there is zero probability not to send out very low momentum stuff in all possible directions. And you have to put some cutoff into your inclusive cross-sections to describe the finite probability of scattering some particles with some unknown stuff going off in other directions. The fact that you're saying unknown stuff means you haven't described the whole Hilbert space of the system. And in fact, the entire discussion of the infrared problem, with the exception of a couple of papers, starting with the work of Fadeyev and Coolidge, discusses only inclusive cross-sections. Okay? It never talks about amplitudes, because if you wanted to talk about amplitudes, you'd have to describe the space of states of these zero-momentum things going out to infinity. In classical GR, these zero-momentum things are precisely what you deal with with the christodoulou kleinerman boundary conditions at space-like infinity. So in this duality between the momentum light cone and the conformal boundary of Minkowski space, space-like infinity maps into the point p equals zero. But you can, you can never produce them, right? Sorry? You can never produce these modes, right? You always produce them in four but dimensions. How do you produce something that's infinitely? Sorry? How, how, does it, how do you produce something 
you, the, the equations of, you know, the, the work of many people, uh, people usually quote Steven Weinberg, who was kind of a culmination of, of some of these things. You have to take these things into account if you want to define infrared finite cross-sections in four dimensions. Now, in higher dimensions, you don't need this to define infant, uh, cross sections, but you do need it to define a unitary S matrix. Because although in higher dimensions, there isn't zero probability not to emit these things, there is a finite probability to emit these things. And so the Hilbert space is not complete if you just think about particles. So I believe that scattering theory should be formulated not in terms of particles, but in terms of flows of quantum numbers out to infinity, thought about in this way in momentum space, and that there should be generators that are concentrated at p equals zero in that algebra. And those generators at, at, just one second, at p equals zero, you cannot neglect the angular dependence of those generators. And if you read Andy's paper, you'll see there's, a, there's an obvious contradiction in the assumption that BMS generators are conserved. Because if BMS generators were conserved and you don't take these things into account, it would tell you that the amount of momentum coming out here would have to be exactly the amount of momentum that goes out in the opposite direction. And it's precisely the things that flow out to infinity that fix that up. Yes, Eva, I'm sorry. Okay. Are you saying there's a lot of entropy without much cost in energy? Yes, exactly. Exactly. You said, even in higher dimensions, you're in saying any you number of dimensions. Well, let's think about higher where we don't have the usual, you know, at least infrared divergences. If right. High enough. Right. But you're saying we, we shouldn't be thinking of these as limits of ordinary particle states. That's right. As because their, their, their momentum distribution doesn't have to be concentrated. These are states where you have momentum that's going out in, it, it, you'll see in a minute. Here's what I define the states to be. So you have this algebra of operators. You have to have a representation of it. And I think the representation of it that's, that's appropriate for scattering theory is what I call jet states, namely Q which has to be smeared with the, some function to give me an operator, should be zero at finite values of p unless the angular part of p is contained in some cones. This is the Sturman-Weinberg prescription for those of you who know QCD. So those are the things that are particle-like. We know that in general they might not be just one particle because you can always be emitting low energy collinear stuff along the particle line. But in addition to that, you have to take into account the fact that there's this diffuse flow of stuff out in all possible directions at very little cost in energy because massless particles cost no energy if they have no momentum. Okay. So let me just make sure I understood what you said a second ago. You said that if we look at the higher dimensional case where there are no infrared divergences, you said that there is a finite probability to admit things with strictly zero momentum, even in familiar theories like QED, and this is some yeah. standard result that I ought to know but don't. Um, no, I don't think you know it, but I think it's true. You think it's? I think it's true. You think so, it's true and every field theorist will agree with you? Or is yeah, I think that's <laughs> correct. I think that if, if, if you do the calculation, that's what comes out. <coughs> Okay, you can you can see it from this Christodoulou Kleinerman argument. You need to do something with these modes that are out there at space like infinity in order to have a proper scattering theory, even in classical gravity, and that's true in any number of dimensions. And if I was doing QED, it would be the same story. QED. Or is there something special about gravity? Well, QED. Yeah, probably it would be the same story. It's, of course, not renormalizable in higher dimensions and so on and so forth. That shouldn't have anything to do with the infrared problem. So, yes, I think so. Yeah. Why doesn't that violate causality? It doesn't violate causality. We're talking about what happens at infinite time. These are scattering amplitudes. 
Oh, I see. So you just create something with input yeah. mode after the null separator. That's right. That's right. OK. I realized there was another question on the finite versus infinite uh, business. And that is, you know, even if I think about a finite diamond, uh, at least naively, there's sort of a non-compactness of the Hilbert space because I can take a particle state going through it and I can boost it to arbitrarily high energies. In no, not, not true. Not in our theory. Okay, so there's some limit to that. Yeah. What cuts that off? Well, boosting is something you can only do at infinity. The Lorentz group is not a symmetry of quantum gravity in a fixed causal diamond. It's an asymptotic symmetry of that acts only on the conformal boundary of Minkowski space. Okay, so turning that around, if I have a very, very high energy particle like that, just one, mm -hmm. and I don't have in mind a big black hole, but just one boosted particle, then I can't think of it in the smaller causal diamond that it runs through? That, I think that's what you just told me. Yes. Yeah, you'll, you'll see in a minute. If you just let me continue, you'll see why in our theory, that's the way to describe it. And by the way, we've so, left plenty of time for discussion, which is... Why. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, I just, you yeah. know, you're asking you questions that I'm going to answer. Okay. So if you let me answer them, then yeah. we can do it. Okay. So now this is what I, cons I consider the, the proper description of scattering theory. And now the important point, which this is an, a new prescription, and I came about it by thinking about what happens in finite causal diamonds. I think you probably need to put this in in, in the usual quantum field theory. I haven't studied the Sturman Weinberg et, et al. work closely enough to see where it comes in. I call this the jet isolation criterion. Namely, you have these jets that are going out in certain finite solid angles that are carrying all of the energy, and then these p equals zero states, okay? These p equals zero states have to vanish in little annuli surrounding the opening angles of those cones. So that what you're sort of saying is, I'm talking about amplitudes where all the zero momentum stuff that's coming out roughly in the direction of finite momentum particles is encapsulated in the Sturman-Weinberg cone. And then there's a little strip around it where there's no zero momentum stuff. And then there can be zero momentum stuff in every other direction. Okay? That gives you a set of constraints on the zero momentum states. And now I'm going to give you a very precise way of thinking about that by going to a finite causal diamond. So the key difference between quantum field theory and quantum gravity, again, following Jacobson and the holographic principle, not the ADS holography, but the holographic principle as it was originally conceived, <coughs> is that um, when I come into a finite diamond, in quantum field theory, what I do is add an infinite set of extra degrees of freedom in addition to these on the boundary. And in fact, if you cut off the quantum field theory in the ultraviolet in any way you like, you find that the number of extra degrees of freedom in a finite volume that's associated with the new stuff is much larger than what was associated with the boundary. This is r cubed versus r squared, and so on. In quantum gravity, what we say is that we go to a finite diamond by cutting off the generators, by saying, no, we don't have Qs for every value of p, but we have Qs for a uh, finite set of angular momenta in the sphere at infinity. And if you do that, and you cut off the angular momentum at n, and you use in any number of dimensions, I'm going to talk just about four here, you use, count the number of spinners with angular momentum up to n, and you say the Hilbert space is swept out by the action of those spinners, which act a finite number of times because of the superalgebra, then you find that the Hilbert space has a dimension that goes like e to the n squared 
more generally, e to the n to the d minus 2. Any number of dimensions. So the index, index little p is independent of this cutoff? The index it? little p is independent of this cutoff. But now I can tell you how you should think about that too. If I'm thinking about a higher dimensional space, which has been compactified, then in that compact dimension, just as in the compact sphere, I should be cutting off something. Now, what do I cut off if I don't have spherical harmonics? Well, I can talk about the spherical harmonic cutoff in a much more general way. It's a cutoff on the spectrum of the Dirac operator on the sphere. And so more generally, talking about a finite in Planck units extra set of dimensions consists of taking a finite set of spinners okay, that um, have some kind of cutoff on the spectrum of the Dirac equation. And that cutoff tells you things about the shape of the internal manifold and so on. And really, that's a subject I have just dipped my toe into. And I'd love to have somebody get interested in that and start working on it. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to do there. So P represents what's going on in the higher dimensions. And in that context, these Zs, if you think about it, are what we call wrapped brain charges in string theory. The Zs transform in the product of two spinners. And so they're anti-symmetric tensors in the extra dimensions. And they have to do with what we would call wrapped brain charges in string theory. Another interesting thing about this that those of you who love ADS-CFT should respond to is that this says that a UV cutoff on the holographic screen is an IR cutoff in space-time. As I go down to smaller and smaller causal diamonds in space-time, that corresponds to cutting off more and more the high angular momentum modes on the sphere at infinity. And so that's the UVIR correspondence um, in, I think, in a much more general way that it appears in ADS-CFT. OK. Now, um, in four dimensions, the cutoff spinner can be thought of as an n by n plus 1 matrix. <coughs> n by n plus 1, if you think of that as the n and n plus 1 dimensional representations of SU2, that contains all spins from a half up to some maximum n minus a half. And um, that is the right way to do the cutoff. So you're, I can think of the size as matrices. There's a way to do that in higher dimensions too, but it's, it's more complicated. Actually, the size are tensors. You, the bilinears in the size are always matrices. And this leads you to a description of the system in terms of matrix models. Um, let me very quickly tell you what I'm talking about here. The capital N on, the, on this transparency corresponds to what I call little n here on the board. One of the principles of holographic space-time, those of you on that side can look at the, pic the corresponding picture over there. <laughs> um, one of the principles is that you do dynamics individually for each time-like trajectory in space-time. And for a given time-like trajectory, you can think of that trajectory in terms of a nested set of causal diamonds as I increase the proper time out from a very small diamond up to the largest size. And then the thing that I called H over there is what I call H in here on the board. It describes the propagation between these two causal diamonds. And in a time symmetric space time like Minkowski space, H in of n and H in of minus n are the same. Okay. And then the whole Hilbert space, I like to think of it. I know Steve hates this, but I like to think of it by keeping the causal diamond at infinity at some very large but finite radius. Okay? And then there's a finite dimensional Hilbert space. Each of these diamonds represents a smaller and smaller tensor factor of that Hilbert space, each in, in, contained in the previous one as a tensor factor of it. 
And then the Hamiltonian acts on the whole Hilbert space, but it's got two pieces. There's one piece that acts causally inside of diamonds, and the other piece acts on everything that's space-like separated from the current diamond. So if I'm talking about H out of N, I'm talking about th something that acts on s things that are space-like separated from this larger N plus 1 diamond. Okay. So you can write down a set of matrix models like this, which have the following form. They are a um, P naught, which I'll describe in a minute, and then 1 over N squared times a trace of the N by N matrix psi dagger psi. And if there are lots of psi's, then you've got a lot of N by N matrices psi dagger psi. This, this thing has an SUN symmetry or just an SU2 <coughs> from the It's got an SUN cross SUN plus 1 symmetry. The fundamental thing started off with SU2. That's right. Of SU2. That's right. You can't write something that breaks the SUN to SU2. No. This does preserve SU2. It's very important that it preserves more than that. And the reason for that is, if I'm thinking about the Hamiltonian for a finite causal diamond, uh -huh. that doesn't actually know about the geometry of space-time completely yet, because the geometry of space-time is encoded in the causal relations between the causal diamonds of different time-like trajectories. What it does know is it knows what the area of the holographic screen is at each time. So it's natural to insist that the dynamics be invariant under area-preserving mappings, OK? And the SUN is that. So, so you eject. That's like uh, some diffeomorphisms where you eject. That's right. an extra principle. That's right. OK. okay. Well, maybe you'll tell me you'll still come to this, but since you just so nicely described this. If I shoot a super high energy particle, you know, straight through the middle of it. I'm still going to come to it. Okay. We're not there yet. <laughs> okay. So now what does the jet state constraint <coughs> translate into? Yeah. Sorry. Before we leave the previous discussion. Okay. Uh, do you call collinear divergences and infrared divergences the same? No, absolutely are, not. Are you, that, so that we, algebra had a collinear singularity in it, yeah. and that's important. And that, that is one kind of divergence, and it, it's something that is taken care of by the Sturman-Weinberg prescription. Mm -hmm. But then the Sturman-Weinberg prescription also describes cross inclusive cross-sections where some amount of energy has gone out in <coughs> stuff you don't look at in any possible direction. And that, that energy in four dimensions has to be finite, but you can take it arbitrarily small and consider how things depend on that cutoff. So okay. in the previous work discussion, where you saw, talked about infrared, infrared divergences or infrared effects, you're strictly speaking not talking about collinear. That's correct. But the jet, as you say, the jet has both aspects. Right, right. So, so what I'm saying is that the JET prescription actually does deal with both aspects. But in the way that it was introduced by St Sturman and Weinberg, it does it without actually looking at what the Hilbert space is. It, def it, de it only talks about inclusive cross-sections where you don't describe the Hilbert space of the stuff yeah. that goes off in arbitrary directions. Okay. That's the stuff that I think is the most important ingredient of the entropy of horizons. Okay. That's infrared. Sorry? But that's truly infrared. That's truly infrared. And now you'll, you'll see that in this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian is funny. It's a matrix model. You're all familiar with matrix models. But N is also the proper time. Okay. So this is a time-dependent Hamiltonian. That shouldn't surprise you if you're thinking about this Hamiltonian that couples together different numbers of degrees of freedom as time goes on, according to the causal prescription. But it's time dependent in a particular way that I chose. And if you look at it, you'll see that it's not a Tuft scaling, which would give me a finite limit for these interactions as n goes to infinity. But it's adiabatically switched off as compared to a Tuft scaling, though not exponentially switched off. 
It's got an extra 1 over n factor. And that 1 over n factor is crucial for several reasons. It's the thing that switches off the interaction between the zero energy things and the particle states. What are the particle states or the jet states in this matrix description? The jet state constraint becomes the following. There's a number I call E. And I insist that in the very large causal diamond at size capital N, the one that Steve would want me to take to infinity, I insist that E times N plus L of the matrix elements of these square matrices vanish on the states. So these matrices are operators. And I want to insist on states. Think of them for the moment as just a bunch of matrix valued fermion <coughs> operators. I'm insisting that a certain number of those fermion operators annihilate the state. If I can do that, it's always possible to deploy by using these SUN transformations to deploy the ones that are non-zero in the following way. The non-zero ones are block diagonal in some basis. There are zeros here. That doesn't mean zero is operators, but there's zero acting on the allowed initial states. And there's one block which is much larger than all of the others, okay, that contains most of the degrees of freedom. It's not set equal to zero. Okay? But because of the nature of the interaction via trace, these things don't interact with this stuff in this configuration. In order to get them to interact, the Hamiltonian has to turn on these matrix elements, has to change the state into a state where these matrix elements are non-zero. And that's the way in which these things interact. Now, what you can show is, number one, if this polynomial in this four-dimensional case is a finite polynomial independent of n, and the coefficients in it go scale in this way so that the overall scaling is 1 over n squared and then the coefficients are of order 1. What, then, what would a tough scaling be? Sorry? What would a tough scaling be? Just a, 1 over n. 1 over n? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. <clears throat> then you can show that this E is a conserved quantity. If I throw in E at n goes to minus infinity, it's asymptotically conserved as n goes to plus infinity. That quantity is the quantity we identify as energy. Okay? And all of these states in the big block on the bottom end up having zero energy and indeed give zero contribution to the Hamiltonian. So the thing I call P naught is just the sum of all the small block sizes. This is another way in which holography comes into this game. The momentum in the uh, holographic direction appears as a, an internal variable in the, in the quantum variables. It's a matrix. Those of you who know matrix theory will be kind of familiar with that particular thing. So the... Um, Dynamics, as I said, is invariant under this finite version of area-preserving diffeomorphisms. And that's something that allows you to understand intuitively why Sakino and Susskind were right. And it's really the same argument that they gave, that generically Hamiltonians of this type will have fast scrambling dynamics. But, but that okay. implies that you, you want a finite a tough coupling to do that. You Sorry? Want a zero a tough coupling to, to have fast scrambling. No, because the, the fast scrambling has two things in it. There's the characteristic time, yeah. which is n in this Hamiltonian. Oh, I see. And then over and above that, it's n times the log of the entropy. So you want it to go to zero as the horizon gets bigger because you want the characteristic time to be the Schwarzschild radius. Right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. So now I just have to tell you what comes out of this. Because of this 1 over n 
extra power of 1 over n, you can argue that the interactions are localized. They get stronger in small causal diamonds. The, uh, there are consistency conditions, which I haven't talked about here. You have to describe things along this trajectory and then along some other trajectory in space-time. And they, they have overlaps, and you have to insist that there be a consistent description of what goes on in the overlaps. And so basically, if something local happens over here and something else local happens over here, I have to copy this local thing that's not in my causal diamond over here into the H out of this trajectory in order to get that consistency. And that shows you that you can put together the local interactions into Feynman-like diagrams. On the other hand, and now we get to Steve's point, if I try to shove more energy, so now let's take some fraction of this energy and say it persists into those degrees of freedom. I'm trying to make them persist into a smaller causal diamond of size small n. There will come a time when it doesn't make sense to write down this constraint. Okay, because it would be saying that this, the states are all constrained okay, to be one particular state. But I have this fast scrambler Hamiltonian that acts with a time scale of order n, and it's going to scramble them all. And so that system will not any longer look like a bunch of particles coming into this black hole. And the scaling and this can be generalized to any number of dimensions, the scaling of when that happens is precisely when the energy is of order the Schwarzschild radius. <coughs> what if you have, again, a null particle, one photon that's boosted to, you know, super Planckian energies? Yes. And in that case, you know, you're not really doing something like making a large black hole. If you were to describe it classically, it'd be something like an Eichelberg sectional solution. It does have a long-range field, and maybe that's the issue. Um, OK, we've, we've discussed this before. I think if you impose translation invariance, you find that you, you just can't do that. In other words, you have to think about that thing in, in, a, in a larger um, causal in a larger causal diamond. Because of its long range, yeah. uh, I, 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 I think so. Think, or, okay. I think so. Nice to but understand that. It's it one would, of the simplest things that probes the that I, I agree with you. And it's not, but you can impose spatial translation invariance on this system fairly easy. So it can't be that that I mean, you know, ends up being a black hole. Yeah. Okay. Because it's, it's got to come out and preserve momentum as well. OK, so these, this set of Hamiltonians, there is a large class of Hamiltonians that behave this way, have things in them that look like particles. They, they have things in them that look like black holes. The black holes are actually unstable, you can show, and decay into particles with a thermal probability. That's just thermodynamics. You ask, what's the probability that a constraint of the type epsilon n will appear spontaneously, well, it's e to the minus epsilon n if there are, um, <coughs> that's how many degrees of freedom I have to constrain to zero. So the scaling of the Hawking temperature with Schwarzschild radius and the de Sitter temperature similarly all come out of a generic model of this type. What does not come out of a generic model of this type is Lorentz invariance. There are important constraints that we would say have to be imposed on the theory that say if I take two geode geodesics which are boosted with respect to each other by a Lorentz transformation in Minkowski space, the physics seen along those two geodesics when I look at overlaps should be the same. We don't know how to impose those constraints. And our only hope is that there are enough free coefficients in this large set of Hamiltonians that all have this generic behavior that we can impose those constraints. However, I should remind you that in string theory, we have found that we can't get Lorentz invariant S matrices for just any old particle spectrum. In these models, the particle spectrum is actually encoded in the algebra of the variables. 
And so not all of these algebras will give rise necessarily to consistent Lorentz invariant theories. So the whole system has been built to be manifestly quantum mechanical, unitary. I've argued to you that it's quasi-local. And um, it also, by the way, I haven't mentioned this, but this 1 over n scaling and the analogous thing in higher dimensions gives you Newton's law at large transfer separations. I, I can't talk about the details of that now. Now, uh, I've gone on for a long time. I'd really like to say a couple of words about cosmology. Um, may I? Yeah, I think. OK. OK, all right. So I claim that this principle, this fundamental principle, that most of, the exci most of the degrees of freedom in the world are not the things we see as local excitation. It is also fundamental to understanding what goes on in cosmology, and in particular to answering the question first asked by Boltzmann, and then more loudly perhaps by Penrose in more recent times, about why the universe began in a low entropy state. In these models, if you don't begin in a low entropy state, there are never any local excitations whatsoever. And so on the basis of that insight, we've tried to develop a theory of what is the most generic low entropy state that would have a description in terms of particles. The most generic low entropy state that you can make that has some localized excitations has a few big black holes in the universe. And then if you end up in de Sitter space, those black holes decay, disappear, there are never very many particles around in the universe at all. We claim that the correct maximal entropy thing that has lots of particles around is a more or less homogeneous isotropic gas of rather small black holes, which then decay into particles. And um, that turns out, in a very surprising way, to lead to a model that should be described as a model of inflation. That description of the physics inside the horizon is compatible with the consistency conditions only if what's going on outside the horizon looks like inflation. And you get a very constrained model that has only a minimal amount of fine tuning of initial conditions and more importantly an excuse for why they're fine tuned. You can live in a universe that's just filled with three large black holes forever. I don't want to. Um, so the, anthropic? What? Well, in a very weak Just way, it's an anthropic argument. Okay. Right? I, it, it's, isn't there some pressure towards having uh, the minimum amount of, uh, you know, then why don't we see just one galaxy? One galaxy is enough, right? Homogeneous so, isotropic gas of black holes does not lead to one galaxy. That's right, but, but what you said is three you black holes. If you make an inhomogeneous configuration, you just have one black hole, no particles whatsoever except the Hawking radiation. And the bigger the black hole is, the less the Hawking radiation looks like anything that could form a galaxy. So it's just, if, if you think about your initial conditions as being normal matter, then this idea that a universe with one galaxy is sort of likely sounds good. But if you think about the initial conditions in these models, that's simply not true. There aren't any initial conditions that will lead to a universe with just one galaxy. Well, I mean, you're saying that uh, what, what the theory would really prefer is just a few big black holes, right? That's right. Then as, as you dial towards a, a homogeneous gas of small black holes, at some point you start to make some galaxies. Much later on. I mean, what happened, the black hole, the, to get particles, you have to have the black holes decaying fairly rapidly. So they have to be fairly small. The black holes in our model have a, a radius equal to the Hubble radius of inflation. Okay, so they're really tiny. You wouldn't get galaxies out of them. Not even, you know, agglomerations of them. It's very possible that the black hole seeds that are needed for galaxy formation in the standard theory of galaxy formation might originate from agglomerations of those primordial black holes that agglomerate before they can decay. That's a real speculation. I don't know. 
But it, it, it's test. very different dynamics than the standard one that we discussed based on you know, the astrophysicist's pre prejudice of only thinking about the physics of simple stuff that they've seen on Earth. Right. Well, I'm just trying to understand what the fact that the universe is so homogeneous and isotropic, is that, is, is it just enforced in the model that things have to be homogeneous? Or are you saying that maximizes the entropy subject to some constraints? Or okay. I'm not just, what is the statement okay. that you're making? So the, there is a, a, a primordial model which is, is no good for anything in which the universe always has maximal entropy. That one is exactly homogeneous and isotropic. Okay. And empty. And empty. It, it, it goes from being what we call the, the P equals rho phase to de -sitter spa empty de Sitter space with nothing in between. Right. Okay. We claim that the things that you can stick in in between by putting constraints on the initial conditions, the things that are more likely to make any number of galaxies will make a lot of galaxies because it's an approximately homogeneous isotropic gas. I don't claim to have proven that statement. Okay, but I, I claim it's not obvious that it's wrong. But the, but the basic idea is the theory wants to make just empty, empty de Sitter space because that's entropically preferred. Then you put some anthropic constraint and you think the thing that, that wins is the universe that we see. Not necessarily the one we see because there are all kinds of other constraints. Uh, this is yeah, yeah, but just, just say something much, homogeneous isotropic. Homogeneous isotropic that, yeah will produce a relatively homogeneous radiation gas. Richard, I'm going to just let me finish and then. So um, this, this uh, model I like because it's finite. It's obviously finite. And it's much more constrained than the quantum field theory models. There are connections between the reheat temperature after inflation, the size of the inflationary fluctuations, various other stuff. And unfortunately, even though it's radically different conceptually, it explains the current data as well as the standard slow roll inflation models. And that's really because all you need to explain the current data is some kind of slow roll metric, which is approximately de Sitter invariant, and a claim that the fluctuations are approximately de Sitter invariant. And that explains everything we've seen. And that can be true and is true in this model, as well as in quantum field theory. The real test would be the tensor <coughs> B mode fluctuations, where this theory gives distinctly different predictions, not so different for the two point function, very different for the three point functions of the tensor modes. But we're not going to measure those anytime soon. So there are very different models of inflation that fit current data but can't be distinguished yet. And I think yet means for a very long time. Do you have then, a particular spectral index in your theory? Yeah. So the, the spectral index for the, for the um, scalars, as in slow roll inflation, depends on the slow roll metric. We have no other constraint on that besides the data on the, on the spectral index. Okay, the, the, the uh, spectral index for the tensors is predicted and it's different than the prediction of the standard slow roll inflation, but it's zero versus R over eight. And as you know, R is already constrained to be pretty small, so that's not a big difference. It may be that the pixie mission can distinguish them, I'm not sure. Depends how small R really is. Okay, let me just quickly say that this, uh, these set, this set of ideas also has applications to supersymmetry breaking, and it gives a formula I wrote down a long time ago for the Gravitino mass that implies that supermultiplets are not too far beyond the LHC. Unfortunately, the twiddle symbols are such that I can't. Um, I, I think the, the phenomenology I've done with these ideas suggests very strongly that we should be seeing um, uh, uh, light sleptons in the next run of the LHC and that we won't see a gluino at the LHC at all. Probably see s some squarks. 
but um, the calculations are not detailed enough to really pin that down very strongly. Um, so the most important thing that I want, things that I want to emphasize to you is that this, this whole picture is radically different from what we think of as quantum field theory and radically different from the way in which we thought quantum theory, field theory emerged from a quantum theory of gravity. We thought that it emerged in the Wilsonian way. There were some degrees of freedom we didn't know about that are up there at very high energies. We integrate them out. We get an effective description of the low energy degrees of freedom, and that's just quantum field theory. And my belief is that these ideas about the covariant entropy bound show you that that's wrong and that, indeed, there are a lot of very low energy degrees of freedom that are missing in quantum field theory. As Willie and I have said, we believe that resolves the paradox that AMPS discovered. And it, uh, by the way, doesn't in any way contradict their arguments. Their arguments are completely correct. It's simple, simply that their decision that the breakdown of quantum field theory meant this highly energetic firewall is just not what's going on. The breakdown of quantum field theory is in these very soft modes that you can sort of see in scattering theory of massless particles. I'm really sorry. I thought when you alluded to Andy's stuff, that was just quantum field theory. No? No. Andy's stuff was gotten by analyzing quantum field theory, but it was the scattering theory of massless particles. That's what it was. And when he did the classical part of it, he was, the Christodoulou Kleinerman don't isolate things into quantized particles. Okay, they're just talking about classical gravitational fields and how they behave at space-like infinity. Right, okay, fine, classical field theory. Yeah, well, classical field theory is hydrodynamics, and it's applicable even when the quantum theory that's describing what the microstates are is not quantum field theory. That's, that's the message of Ted's paper, and I wish he were here that, so that I could thank him for saying that again, because I think it's really important. We'll tell him to listen to the recording. But just to repeat Eva's question, the part that sounds odd in the summary is that you motivated this BMS algebra talking about what we can equally well call effective field theory at uh, infinity of Minkowski space. But then you want to say that there's, that when you apply the idea that there's this BMS algebra and that there are these zero momentum modes in a finite diamond, <coughs> you need something very different. From yeah. So, the, so the, the real issue is the following. When I think about infinity, okay, um, there are lots of things that can be infinite that can't be infinite in a finite causal diamond. So the energy that goes out is totally unbounded at infinity. Okay? It could be anything you like. The um, number of states is infinite because the causal diamond has an infinite size. And now the, the real key is there are these things that we've always in the discussion of the infrared problems neglected as a bother and said, we're not going to talk about all of these things we describe as very low momentum particles going out in arbitrary directions. We're just going to sum over all of that and define inclusive cross sections. Namely, we're not going to discuss the whole Hilbert space. Okay? Now we back off to a finite causal diamond. Now you can't hide behind infinity anymore. Okay? You have to say, of that stuff in the Hilbert space that's left over in the finite causal diamond, if you believe in the holographic principle, how much of it should I think of as particle stuff? And how much should I think of as zero energy stuff that quantum field theory traditionally doesn't describe? It describes it as limits of zero momentum particles. And doesn't, you know, it, it sort of the Fox space description of what's going on kind of breaks down because you have infinite numbers and so on and so forth that are possible of zero momentum particle. Our claim is that these matrix models make very precise how to do that split. 
You do that split by saying that the analog of a scattering state in the matrix model is a state where these square matrices are block diagonal with a big block that plays the role of the zero energy stuff and small blocks that play the roles of the jets. In usual sort of quantum field theory, if we were really thinking about restricting to finite regions, say finite causal diamonds, presumably we'd basically be discarding these states, right? Because no, it's, they're really in the zero energy limit. Well, it's, it's, it's really complicated in quantum field theory because in quantum field theory, those states can evolve from high momentum states that fit into a final causal diamond, okay, by, you know, splitting off of soft photons. Yeah, but not in finite time somehow. You don't actually get to the zero well, that's, energy. That's true, but they, yeah, so that's the reason that we would have said, oh, these are not relevant for a finite causal diamond. Right. And precisely our models are saying, no, that's they wrong. Are relevant. So they that's are a big relevant. difference. So yes, that's absolutely. That's okay. You're saying that gravity needs an infrared completion more than yes. it needs an UV completion? Yes, 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 yes. Now, a really interesting question, which I don't know the answer to, is I've thought a little bit about how to extend these ideas um, to ADS-CFT. And so the question is, in the CFT Hilbert space, how do I think about this breakup between the different sorts of degrees of freedom? And one of the ideas, and I don't know whether this is right, is something like the following. We usually think about the correspondence between bulk particle physics and the boundary conformal field theory by thinking about these finite numbers of correlators of gauge invariant operators. Now, there's something that we know from the very beginning almost of the ADS-CFT correspondence, in fact, it predates the ADS-CFT correspondence, namely the Hawking page transition, that if you think about the thermodynamics of this system in terms of those excitations, you make a mistake above a certain temperature, and suddenly the entropy jumps up to being of order n squared, and we do not have a description in ADS-CFT of that n-squared set of degrees of freedom sure in terms do. of a, but we have it in the CFT in terms of the description, in terms of underlying n-squared gluons. Yeah. Right. That's not, those are not in one-to-one -one correspondence with any space-time particle. <laughs> okay. Okay. So what, what this corresponds to in a more gauge invariant way is traces of huge number of operators that scale where the number of operators scale like n, not finite polynomials in n. Those are the, those are the states in quantum field theory that are contributing to the high entropy. And I claim that we don't really have a space-time interpretation of those states. So if I've got n by n matrices, especially if I have a bunch of them, I can make polynomials of order n that are independent operators. And what, what's, what do they correspond to? Okay. So I, I would suggest going on the Coulomb branch and looking at the states there to get as close as you can to seeing the n squared. On the Coulomb branch? Oh, you mean the, the finite energy things? Um, I mean n squared. Yeah, yeah, you can see an n squared there, absolutely, in quantum field theory. But what, is, what does that correspond to in terms of particles in ADS space? Strings between the D-brains. Yeah, okay. So maybe in the weak coupling string theory description, that's a way to think about it, sure. But it's not. It's not quantum field theory. And there, the, these, these are states that are coming in. What I'm not understanding about that comment is these are states that are coming in at very low energies because the Hawking page transition occurs at a low temperature. All right, the Hawking page transition. I wasn't really trying to connect it to that. I was just saying as close as I understand one can get to seeing the M squared on the gravity side. 
But I don't see on the gravity side why those are low energy states with an energy that would be excited at the Hawking yeah, patients. They're not in general low energy. That's true. Sorry? It's true that they're not in general low right. energy. But the Hawking page transition tells us that there is something going on at low energy. So, so that's the basic presentation? Okay. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh. If anybody else who wants to hear more details about this, I'm willing to talk probably, you know, as n goes to infinity. <laughs> infinite amount well, we about this stuff. People, but but I'm oh. sure that's a very small subset, much less than and of the people here. And so um, anybody who wants to come and set up something, we can talk more about. It. Yeah, we'll try to figure this out. And also, I I don't want to cut things off. I want to give people an opportunity to leave, but we could continue discussion if uh, some more. If Tom has stamina for that, I have stamina. Not you should supply water for the speaker. <laughs> Get better answers when they reach the uh, stage of dehydration. When <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said you've noticed. <laughs> well, further questions or discussion? Yeah. The normal objection to that would be that that ought to change the well, the answer is that it's included in the classical field theory, and it has to do with the boundary conditions you put on the classical field theory at space like infinity. So, yeah. so, yeah. Well, it, you know, it, I think it's very, 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 it, it's a very subtle thing about infinity. So when you say ordinary quantization, what you do is you take the free field theory of massless particles, you talk about the Fox space of the free field theory. What these excitations correspond to are um, excitations of infinite numbers of very, very low energy particles whose total energy adds up to, in that Fox space language, whose total energy adds up to, you know, the Sturman-Weinberg cutoff energy. So you're effectively not imposing asymptotic flatness or asymptotic anything, you're saying fluctuations. Are these things don't affect asymptotic flatness. That these are these are the things that in the Christodoulou Kleinerman boundary conditions for scattering theory in asymptotically flat space time, you have to include a discussion of what happens, how you tie together the modes that space like infinity defined on the positive uh, side of of uh, the conformal boundary with those on the negative side of the conformal boundary. They are in the regular theory. If you do the regular theory of particles, what you find are generally in four dimensions, infrared divergences, where you have to put a cutoff on and say, I'm going to talk about inclusive cross sections where I've allowed an arbitrary number up to infinity. And I don't even know if those states are really in the Fox space because nobody ever talks about the Hilbert space of those states. The actual thing that's defined is inclusive cross sections, okay? Which say, I don't care what the Hilbert space of those states is. I'm just going to sum over them with the constraint that they took away so much energy, no more. How that works in field theory, and you're working in one of your finite diamonds. So basically, the diamond's putting on an IR cutoff. So, but you can't talk about energy in the finite diamond. Energy is an asymptotic quantity. It's very explicit in our models. There's no such thing as conserved energy in the actual quantum dynamics of this system because the Hamiltonian is time dependent. And the energy is only defined globally. The but thing there that's there is unusual QFT if you're matching onto QFT approximately, you know, up to well, there the isn't. There's there's off, stuff going on at the boundaries in QFT. Yeah, so yeah, it's <coughs> small things. Well, I don't know what's small in QFT. The Hilbert space of a causal diamond is infinite dimensional, and the number of states an arbitrary distance from the horizon yes. is infinite. Well, okay. Yeah, this is, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. So, you know, what energy do you assign to those states? Well, normally, I would say, you know, I think they're very short distance modes, mm 
they have very high energy. Of course, that's not true if I'm on an accelerated trajectory. Okay. So. I'm sorry. One way of saying what you're about uh, would be to say that uh, you're saying you're uh, you're playing with the idea that inclusive cross sections uh, don't capture the entirety of the theory. Absolutely not. So so even in the infrared discussion in QED. No, I think that's an open question. I don't think anybody's ever proven that they do. Excuse me. There's a, there's a beautiful paper by Fadeyev and Kulish, okay, which defines a Hilbert space of scattering states for QED. A Hilbert space, not just inclusive cross-section, in which every state has an infinite number of particles in it, okay, every charged particle state. And they, uh, Kulish pointed out to me that they actually did this for gravity too, but it was published in a Russian journal and they're, you know, and it, it was sort of obscure to everybody in the West, but I can get you the reference. I have it in, in my email someplace, in some of my papers. The claim of Fedeyev and Kulish in the end was that charged particles don't exist. Well, what they meant was that the actual thing you call a charged particle is this very, very complicated state, which has a charged particle with its Coulomb field and with it, all these soft photons, both in the initial and final states. When and that that's the space of states on which you can define. When you say don't exist, did you mean that the, the propagator doesn't have a proper pole, that it has some kind of weird branch cut? That's part of the story for sure. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the question of how, yeah, how to really define them. Now, there's other, they may not have had the last word on the subject, but uh, yeah, there that is, was, I think, what they did. There, there, there has been some more modern literature in the gravity case that claims to improve upon what Fadeyev and Kulish did. Um, I, I don't know how this guy, he, he's Indian. He, he wrote me an email, and I can't remember his name. Um, Starts with an A. I, again, I can dig it out for you. Oh, and, oh. Um, could be. He's um, works in the U.S., but he's in. The, yeah. Yeah, I think that could might be. Yeah, it might be a Curry. You're yeah, right. Uh, and so sure. there's there's a bunch of literature on this. The 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 yeah. fundamental you know the field theory of it is you know it's in all these little obscure papers. And it hasn't been worked out. And it's just not something, you know, we don't pay attention to it. And in higher dimensions, we all said, oh, there are no infrared divergences. We don't have to worry about this. But that's not correct because the infrared divergences have to do with the fact that in four dimensions, you can't avoid spitting out an infinite number of particles. But in higher dimensions, you will spit them out with some probability. Okay, those, the, those states exist in the Hilbert space and they, there is some probability that you'll produce them. And so if you want an exactly unitary S matrix, you have to include them even when there are no infrared divergences, I would claim. There's this paper by Andy and his students about uh, the BMS thing by why to QED? I mean, it's not BMS, but it's right. some, I think it was some sub group of U1 or something. That's right. It's a, it's a U1 current algebra. Right. So yeah. it's, a, it's, it's the same kind of idea. If, in, if you think about I, what I think is the proper way to think about scattering, you should think about operators that describe flows of quantum numbers through some part of the boundary at infinity. And this is what they also say. That's what they're saying. So it, they've done it for Yang Mills theory. They've done a lot more technical field theory stuff than I have on this. The, the one thing that I think that they have sort of missed, which I think is makes things a lot more transparent, is this transformation to momentum space. It, this is familiar to people who've done um, light front quantization because it's, it's a covariant analog of getting rid of the longitudinal direction in favor of the longitudinal momentum. Okay. And the the uh, that um, that always simplified things in light front quantization, and I think it does here too. 
um, especially when you start trying to think about how you're going to describe massive particles in the, at null infinity. You have to, in the standard way of doing it, you have to add these points at infinity that aren't part of the manifold, and you know you, you, your operator algebra looks completely ridiculous. Whereas if you think in momentum space, you just have to define operators that carry positive energy, but with both signs of momentum. And, and the massive things correspond to things that carry the proper um, combination of, of the two signs of momentum. Um. I, I didn't understand your point about the uh, states in ADCT. The fact that the whole contains temperature is low. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the fact that temperature is low, uh, I mean, the sudden point of the high energy phase, temperature phase is dominated by very heavy states, so they have energy rather than square, even though the temperature is uh, parametric. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right about that. That's because, um, right. What I, oh, yeah. Your, your so did you maybe no no it, 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 and I, I said it myself when I talked about these things that are traces of very right, right. very large numbers of, mm -hmm. of uh, m's so yeah the the conformal dimension of those operators in the conformal field theory is definitely very high mm -hmm. so it, that that was a I told you I was speculating like crazy at that point and I haven't thought this through. But maybe the, the gap between those states. The, the gap, gap between those states is, of course, e to the minus the entropy, and, and so that that is what's important in that in that context. Um, right. And so the transition occurs at low temperature because the entropy is so much bigger, even though the energy is low. Sorry. I was, um, so if we were just calculating in in ordinary garden variety perturbative quantum gravity. BPHC renormalizing things away. And instead of trying to look at S matrix elements or inclusive rates and cross sections, I was just looking at correlators. Would you say that something is being missed or not missed by the usual formulas? Well, I don't know how to define um, gauge invariant correlators that don't have UV problems, as I think you know. Yes. <laughs> OK. So um, I, I think that that's a symptom of something. Um, and, and I think the proper observables are observables at the boundary, but that the, you know, sort of thinking about these uh, these algebras of currents at the boundary is kind of the right way to think about what the asymptotic Hilbert space is. And I, I really think there's a lot of work in perturbative quantum gravity that should be done to sort of flesh out these ideas. And I don't claim to have completely understood it. I think Andy has done a lot more um, in, in sort of trying to figure it out. But he, um, in, in a lot of his papers, he's, he's very much wedded to you know, deriving the old particle physics results in terms of his algebras rather than thinking about and he, he thinks of the algebras as symmetry algebras rather than the things that are kind of mapping out the space of asymptotic states, which I think is is a more proper way to think about them. Suppose I do just fix a gauge and I tried to look at correlators uh, and I use the usual formalism. Would that be right or wrong? Would I be missing something if I did that or not? I don't know what you're calculating. What are we calculating? I don't know how to calculate anything. So once I fix a gauge, I can always invariantize the operator in that gauge and rewrite it as some invariant. No, I, un I understand. Weird, weird okay. I'm, so, so Richard, despite everything that's gone on in the past 15 years, I'm still a bit of a string theorist. Okay. In string theory, we never ran into anything that looked anything like those operators. And we seemed to have a completely consistent UV finite theory. One of the issues that we never dealt with was, you know, in four dimensions, it wasn't IR finite, and you know, that I, I kept but commenting about. That's an S matrix theory. theory. I see the problem. That's there. an S matrix theory. I see the problem. Right, there. but the evidence from that and from ADS-CFT was that the only completely gauge invariant things. <laughs> 
were these S matrix elements. Now, the way our formalism gets around that is by abandoning gauge invariance, by saying that the way to do quantum mechanics in quantum gravity, solving also the famous problem of time, is to do quantum mechanics individually along each time-like trajectory in the space-time. And if you were someone who believes that the metric fluctuates, then you say, what the hell are you talking about? But the whole point of Ted Jacobson's paper for me is that I shouldn't think about the metric as fluctuating, except when I'm talking about a system with a ground state and looking at small fluctuations around that ground state, in which case the background metric is not fluctuating and the small fluctuations behave like particles. So the, the, the essence of our approach is to take this Jacobson picture, say, you give me a space-time, give me that space-time, let's look at all possible time-like trajectories in that space-time. I'm supposed to supply for you a time-dependent Hamiltonian that describes causal physics along each of those trajectories in a way such that if I compare what goes on in the overlap of the causal diamonds of two particular trajectories at two particular times, that the density matrix on that overlap predicted by the two different systems is the same up to a unitary. That's our fundamental principle. So it's, it's a way of doing quantum mechanics that is gauge fixed because the quantum mechanics always has to do with picking out a particular time-like trajectory. And that's what fixes the gauge. And you do time-like trajectory in the time depend in quantum mechanics in the proper time along that trajectory, and then you just do it lots of times and make everything consistent. And, and if you take Jacobson's point of view about geometry, which I think he still believes in, half of him believes in it anyway, um, then this is a perfectly sensible thing to do because you should not generically think about geometry as quantum fluctuating. And when you, when you write down a black hole metric, for example, as something that gets produced by scattering of particles in space-time, which is something that definitely happens in our little models, something analogous to that happens in our little models, there are two different ways to think about it. You can think about the fundamental quantum mechanics, in which case there's this time-like cylinder in the background space-time, which is Minkowski space. And inside that time-like cylinder, there's no local description, because that's where the black hole is. This is the, stretched, the inside of the stretched horizon of the black hole. And then that slowly decays away by emitting particles. So the cylinder shrinks. And that's a description that's completely quantum mechanical. On the other hand, you might say, oh, the system that's in there has a huge amount of entropy, so all I really want to talk about is a coarse-grained hydrodynamic description of it. Then I say, oh, look, the black hole metric is what gives me that. And it indeed gives me the proper temperature and all of that stuff, and the, you know, the rates of particle production, but it doesn't explain what the microstates are that are giving rise to those processes. So it's playing precisely the role of hydrodynamics. And the reason that it does is because of Ted's argument. Because Ted said, if you have a quantum system that associates entropy to area, then it will look like Einstein's equation. Its hydrodynamics will look like Einstein's equations. That's what he said. So, I don't know. I've, ever since I realized that that's what he said, I've been very excited about his paper. And I wish we had read it more carefully seven years before we did. Okay, I should shut up. Okay, thanks again.